वेलकम एवरी वन टू दिस पब्लिक डिस्कशन मार्किंग हेजा मेरा बोर्ड ऑन हिज डेथ एनिवर्सरी टूडे एंड Uh, a discussion on the question of resources, indigenous rights, and livelihoods in Northeast India. Uh, from collective, we thought of organizing a series of events on remembering our revolutionary legacy of uh, from 26 to 28 September. 26 being the death anniversary of Hidam Irabot, and 28 being the birth anniversary of uh, Bhagat Singh, and the death anniversary of Shankar Bhuwan <coughs> Neogi. So. As a part of that, today we are here with uh, Dolly Kikon, who is an anthropologist in the University of Melbourne. Uh, we are here with uh, Tarun Bhartia, who is from the Riot Collective, and Akhu Chingangbam, who is a musician, and with Imphal Talkies. Uh, and they'll be uh, discussing these issues with us. Uh, we are. Celebrating and remembering Hidam Irawat's legacy today, because uh, for a brief introduction, he was from uh, Manipur and he was a commu communist uh, political activist and cultural from uh, Manipur who organized extensively uh, throughout his life. He organized presence on different questions against both the British rule and. the feudal system of oppression and exploitation which existed in his time and he was imprisoned in 1938 and in, during his imprisonment he actually met uh, communist uh, leaders and activists uh, a, a while in prison and through that association he also developed a leaning towards a certain kind of progressive politics after which for a long period of his life he spent organizing among peasants and the uh, and the toiling masses uh, and uh, towards the end of his life after uh, independent india is also being formed he actually contested elections he was an elected mla as well but the group he belonged to the group he helped form was outlawed un in independent india and Uh, the last years of his life he spent in exile and was ultimately martyred in uh, 1951 so we are remembering his uh, legacy today because these questions of uh, a kind of unequal relationship uh, that's been imposed on what we uh, speak of as northeast india has continued and persisted since that time till uh, today with different variations different histories but there has also been a continuity of exploitation and extraction these questions have persisted uh, just in the past few months this during the covid-19 crisis we've seen different kinds of policies being adopted by this uh, current regime uh, using the present crisis and steamrolling policies and projects in the region which uh both disturb the resources and biodiversity of the region and also obviously have an impact on the question of livelihood and people's daily lives from the dibang valley hydropower project being approved to coal mining being approved in the dehing patkai elephant reserve to the explosion in the bagjan oil field which we saw all of these uh incidents have just happened in the past few months and it's clearly an indication of a long standing history of uh, relations which have been unequal um, and there was also simultaneously been resistance against the same and resistance and struggle for a better kind of society and uh, a livelihood system of living for people uh, and it is that history also that we were looking at the livelihoods and indigenous rights memory of hija mera good so with that i would like to chin today this is uh, dolly kikon who is a anthropologist of city of melbourne and and dealt extensively with the question of uh, the politics of resource extraction social political dimensions that has had the effects it has had 
So I would like her to begin with her presentation. Um, hello, uh, I have very good friends here, I can see, and also uh, others. So uh, I'm very happy to be on board this uh, collective. I would like to thank the collective, Shambhavi, and uh, all the friends here who invited me uh, to be part of this uh, celebration and remembrance. I am zooming in from Melbourne here in Australia. So as I share my thoughts uh, about my journey uh, with resource extraction and what I have been up to all these years, I would like to uh, begin by uh, acknowledging that I am on the lands of the Wurundjeri people who have been custodians of this land for thousands of years. And I acknowledge and pay my respects to elders past and present on whose land I work and I live today. I was very uh, humbled that I'm, I'm invited for uh, remembering and celebrating the life of uh, Hijam Irapod. This is both usual and a little unusual because I come from the Northeast where in terms of uh, nationalism and ethnicity and who should speak for which leader and who should be repassed is at times very clearly demarcated. Um, there are voices, I come from Nagaland and there are voices who keep saying that only Nagas are allowed to do research and write about Nagas and no other people should do that. In a, in a way who invite and who say that witnesses ultimately are and also acts of solidarity that go the longest way. So today, as I come on board to remember and celebrate Hijam Irapod, I would say that we are also breaking tradition because usually it would be just people from Manipur that to the valley who would come and speak about this wonderful, amazing leader. Young people, collective are making a difference. And this is where during a pandemic where we are all locked inside in different parts of the world, I see hope in the spirit of solidarity emerging. In that spirit, I would like to also call upon my, my Naga friends, brothers and sisters, that the next time we celebrate Piso, the next time we celebrate Kodao, uh, the next time we celebrate the, the lives of Bhupen Hazarika, it should be neighbors, it should be collectives, it should be people from all over the world who are invited to rejoice in this. I, from 1896 to 1951, it's fascinating. I would say a modern day communist Simbad who went all around from Stilhet mobilizing the non assamese tea workers, um, writing, being part of dramas, being part of the theater world. When you look at his life, time, in 1932, he started a magazine, which was a handwritten magazine. And I look at that and I say, never, never mess around. The state should have known, you can never mess around with somebody who starts a handwritten magazine at any point in their life. And I think that is the spirit of both restlessness and of power that he lived. Life. He died. According to sources, he died along the foothills of the Tango village in Burma. And I wondered at his life, how is it that I can talk about this magnificent personality and how is it that we can perhaps claim his spirit not only within the valleys of Manipur but across the region and beyond. How is it that today we can come together from this small, which is often described as remote, 
<laughs> underdeveloped, and yet talk about big personalities who dreamt big. Um, I would like to perhaps then take the landscape where he last spent his time on earth, the foothills, and draw a connection to my field site as an anthropologist. That's where I ended up doing my field work as a PhD um, student. That's where even when I was in the low world, I was attracted to. What is it about the foothills that attracts us? The Northeast region of India, it's all divided between the hills and the valleys. It's very, very clearly demarcated. For instance, Nagaland is known as a hill state, Assam, parts of it, a greater part of it, known as the Brahmaputra Valley. What do these divisions, both landscape, memory, tell us about a past? And as an anthropologist, I began to unearth a colonial past, and it was only through resource extraction that I began to see a different world. I started my journey as an activist from uh, Delhi University, I uh, lived in Indra Vihar with many, many lovely friends. And this invitation, after a long time, brought very fond memories because when I was a student in the university, our rock star here, Aku, was a student in a school. And the first time I saw him, he had come to visit his auntie, <laughs> um, Prabha. And he was a high school boy and he was learning how to play the guitar around that time. So he wouldn't talk to us. Perhaps he, he would just face the wall and sit. But that was the cosmopolitan world that we came from as young activists in Delhi University. That is the world where first time we were invited to celebrate actually the life of Hijab Report. And pretty much around this time, the 26th of September, I remember Diren, I remember Munin, I remember Kishan, and all the friends actually who would cook cook Sinju, who would make Sinju, and in, in, in some Bersati we would remember. And that's the spirit, perhaps, that I was very much um, drawn to as I thought about this collective this evening. So it is with a lot of fond memories and solidarity that I come to you all. Perhaps not so much to talk about my individual journey and the book that I've written or in terms of my research, but to perhaps contextualize that even the book, even the extractive journey that I embarked, which I took, was a gift from an activist friend who died. And I say this very clearly that the book that I ended up writing, um, this one, uh, Living with Oil and Coal, this is, this is the US press. There is now an Indian edition from Yoda, so please look at the South Asia print in Indian rupees. And I say that very clearly that this gift, this book and the, and the stories that I write here is a gift from, from an activist friend who lost his life in 2007. He lived all his life along the foothills of Assam and Nagaland in a small coal mining village called Geliki. And the militarized nature of the landscape along with Armed Forces Special Spark under which we live eventually took its life. The central industrial forces which were guarding the oil rigs and the tea plantations uh, saw him as a suspicious character who was returning from a Naga village one night late after a meeting with the Naga elders and killed him along with his friend. The third person who was traveling with them was injured. And, and that's how, in a sense, I began to see how violent the yes, central industrial thing under Afspa was. And it is in his death that I began to see, even after years of actually campaigning against the repeal of Armed Forces Special Spar Act, till that time as a young activist, I only saw, I only saw bodies, uh, tortured bodies or disappeared bodies, in a sense, of the effects of militarization. It took the death of an acti activist, of his friend, injuries, that in my becoming as an anthropologist, writing about the landscape and militarization and resource extraction, did I see the vastness and the depth of how militarization actually at the heart of it also constitutes militarizing the resources and, and everything that we 
hold dear to our heart. What do I do in my book, uh, Living with Oil and Coal? I am basically a storyteller. I am very sense that as I was being trained to become an anthropologist, telling method that I was trying to trying to um, this is also perhaps I would say you know in my 40s rediscovering my my tribal heritage my indigenous heritage of storytelling which is very very central I am first generation and I never grew up with books in the house with, with, with stories or with fables or with folk tales. It was only really a lot of word of, word of mouth stories um, that in a way impacted me and my values of who I am as I was growing up. So as I began to see the landscape of oil and tea in the foothills of Assam and also in Nagaland, I began to draw upon that strength and that spirit of storytelling. And I thought that that would, in a way, help me to tell a story that was important. It's up to you as readers to pick up this book, read. You can critique it, I'll be very happy. Because the idea and the process of writing a book is that, as a writer I speak, that another person who writes should write a better book than this. And it's in that spirit that I offer. I would also like to bring attention to the Bagjan uh, oil spill, which has been happening since June. And I say that very clearly, that we need to continue to amplify the voice. Because right now, as activists, right now, as people dis displaced from the oil spill, from that landscape of Bagjan, comes up and talks about it. It is perhaps those of us listening on Facebook, those of us zooming in here, to think about the, the largeness and the depth and, and the violent nature of what extraction is doing to us. I have written an essay called Toxic Ecologies, which I'm very happy to share that it's been translated in Assamese. It should come out. Um, and what I have done there is actually to give a, a historical um, grounding about extraction in the region. So I'll stop my sharing here and I'll give time to my other friends because I'm trying to hear what our lovely friend Tarun has to say, uh, a trailblazing riot <laughs> collective team member and also a filmmaker and our dear, dear Aku is here. So thank you very much. Oh. Uh, thanks, uh, Dolly. I guess uh, after first round of uh, the when once the second speaker is also done, we'll come back to a lot of things you've raised uh, as well. Um, then, as the next speaker, I would like to call Aku Chingangum, who is uh, with the Imphal Talkies, and I would like him uh, to speak. He'll speak a little bit about Hidam Airport himself. Uh, the other, like the larger theme of the discussion today. So, Aku, if you can. Uh, hello, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Not okay. Uh, I'm just here. And uh, I don't think I'm an expert on this, you know, uh, topic, the theme that. Uh, Delhi Collective chose, uh, and, and thanks to uh, Collective for having us. And it's, uh, it's it's always wonderful to listen to Dolly. And uh, we have come a long way since 1999. <laughs> and uh, we also have Tarun. Actually, Tarun is someone that uh, I uh, how I was introduced to some of the poets of Manipur uh, from 1960s. It was through, a, uh, I think, uh, what do you call it? Some sort of a paper or article that Tarun wrote, uh, I don't know, a long time ago. I, I think it was in mid-2000. Uh, you know, I'm still thankful to him for that because we grew up, you know, in Manipur. I grew up in Manipur, but I never got to know the poets, you know, that I am now very close to. They have actually become my friends. and. Uh, Thanks to uh, Tarun for that. And I'm looking forward to listen to Tarun. Uh, it's a, I, I think it's a uh, you know, uh, great time to celebrate uh, 
personality like ism we have got in this uh, times you know where you have you know fascism you know rising you know the trying to you know control your resources you know trying to take over indigenous uh, land uh, it, it's good to remind us that you know we were once you know guarded by leaders like ism we report and um, but sadly uh, i mean we still have uh, you know lots of issues but we are lack of leaders like ism we report you know uh, i know you know in manipur we haven't had I think it's been 65 years that we lost her, but you know, we still need to study his work. I mean, there are so many things that we haven't covered. You know, even, you know, even when you Google his mirabo, you won't get just there's you know here and there some bits you know in Wikipedia and here and there. So, but there are lots of things uh, that needs to be done. Uh, you know, especially research uh, from the research side. Now I don't know how many people have done, but Uh, I've been, uh, you know, hearing about Irabot since my, uh, you know, my my maternal grandfather was a hardcore, uh, uh, you know, Irabot fan, and he was a communist. Uh, he, I don't know how far it is true, but my grandfather, he, you know, when when before Irabot went underground uh, in 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 late forties, uh, he said that he shared meal with uh, Irabot, you know, that kind of thing. So. much about irabo you know irabo has been part of the you know uh, story that i grew up with you know listening to uh, stories from my uh, grandfather so my grandfather would put his uh, you know photo frame next to uh, irabo and you know lenin <laughs> and all this uh, he was a hardcore uh, communist so so i will uh, i have been traveling across uh, assam and uh, silet uh, the history and uh, roots of uh, you know the manipuri diaspora in assam uh, especially in barak valley and surma valley uh, surma valley which is now currently uh, you know silet and uh, parts of tripura uh, so there when i go uh, you know i, I was i'm very lucky to meet this guy uh, a, a cultural activist named ak sheram he is he is someone who started this uh, bangladesh manipuri sahitya sangsad you know way back in 1970s just after uh, pakistan uh, you know east pakistan you know became bangladesh so uh, he is someone that who took a, you know very uh, keen interest on irabot's life and and he he said many stories you know how uh, irabot got out of the silet prison you know how he uh, uh, worked with the youth there and then even it seemed that he wrote uh, plays and dramas in uh, bengali where the the bengali students uh, the youth they would you know uh, play the you know uh, use his uh, script and then you know they will travel together and play this uh, plays you know in, in in several institutions back then and uh, to me uh, irabot had uh, irabot uh, what do you call a true artist with all the you know quality and talents uh, you know and a, and a, and a, and, a, and a revolutionary with the right vision you know uh, to look forward you know uh, for a collective society and uh, i i i think i think uh, it's all available uh, you know what do you call uh, the information on irabot and i don't know how much i should talk about him but uh, i i would like to mention uh, one uh, particular uh, point where uh, you know we have this uh, colin nupilan uh, the first uh, women's war happened in 1904 1904 and then the second one happened in 1939 so i would uh, talk a bit about uh, 1939 uh, this nupilan we call it nupilan so uh, it, it was a time that uh, the the maharaja you know uh, make policies with the with the british uh, rulers you know in manipur and 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 the middlemen like you know the the marwari businessmen were taking care of the you know uh, the economy you know and and the indiscriminate uh, you know export of rice manipur uh, that actually led to uh, a famine like situation in manipur and these women are actually the ones who work in the fields you know who who harvest uh, paddy you know and and 
they were not able to you know uh, get what 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 they you know actually harvested because you know everything was sent off so in uh, its belief in uh, it was uh, december 12 1939 the women came out you know agitating against uh, you know the the marwari businessmen against the monarch against uh, you know uh, the the british rulers so that uh, iraq boat was not there on that day actually but uh, he came back from kasar and then gave a long speech uh, it seems and then uh, he was arrested uh, you know and then and then sent to uh, silet you know because he the 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 government the 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 what do you call the manipur state darbar were actually scared of keeping him in manipur because uh, you know the people were uh, starting to support him you know it, it could cause uh, certain revolution back then and then he was sent to silet prison and uh, i was told i think tarun will uh, talk about this uh, you know about the jail uh, uh, episode uh, so so i think he became very good friends with the uh, communist uh, leader uh, you know hemango biswas and then uh, there are stories about uh, you know how they became friends and then traveled together to uh, you know uh, after they got out together uh, you know how they traveled to silchar and then hide in the certain houses in silchar and also this i uh, got to know uh, more from rongili biswas uh, she is a daughter of uh, hemango biswas so she has been extensively uh, doing research on uh, hemango biswas and uh, we got to you know we got started you know talking about uh, my experience you know about the board you know which i uh, my experience in silet listening to all the stories to all the elders and then she also started sharing so we started sharing you know emails and all so i think it's actually like talk uh, but still uh, uh, there was a what do you call it, a huge uh, bonding between these two you know leaders and even i i believe uh, evan gobeswas even wrote uh, this uh, you know a wonderful long poem called uh, sentinel of the frontier like you know the the watchman of the uh, eastern eastern frontier and this is a uh, book of poem uh, which was uh, published uh, in 1987 uh, this uh, it has all the poems which uh, irabot wrote uh, in 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 silet prison you know when he was there from uh, 1939 to 1943 yeah so it's again like you know we need to it, it, it needs to be uh, translated uh, you know so that people can uh, you know know more of uh, this wonderful uh, you know hero and uh, 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 before all this happened uh, you know he formed this uh, what do you call uh, nikhil hindu manipuri sabha you know as, as a, he was part of the you know king's court and some and uh, they had uh, uh, actually what happened was uh, this was the establishment uh, you know this 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 uh, masaba uh, which actually you know talked about social reformation you know through various uh, you know activities so so in manipur back then in 1930s it was uh, like what you call very hinduized you know uh, in manipur we have this thing called chandan uh, you know we put some sort of a chandan i don't know what we call it we call it chandan here so we you put it you know and then uh, people who put chandan uh, you know you have to pay you know uh, to this brahma sabha you know as a tax you know for doing that uh, you know for so this kind of thing you know this this masaba uh, you know both started it the king was also a patron of this uh, establishment and, and uh, they actually tried to remove this kind of thing and then much later uh, irabot removed the term hindu from this hindu uh, nikhil hindu uh, manipuri mahasabha so he removed hindu and then i i think he himself was again later thrown out of the, this same group and and from the state darbar also uh, because he got to you know radicalize and then he got uh, he 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 became a communist and all and uh, so th- I, I i'm sure that tarun would uh, you know fill up my <laughs> this thing and then uh, like uh, dolly said uh, you know uh, to me i want to look at his you know artist uh, what do you call as a writer 
Uh, he's someone who started the Manipur Sekhe Parishad. He was the first general secretary of, you know, uh, Sekhe Parishad in 1935. And Sekhe Parishad is still a very active uh, organization in Manipur when it comes to, you know, uh, literature and then how they have been, you know, uh, safeguarding the literature from, you know, from, from early 20th century. And uh, there's so much, uh, so many things that, that we can talk about uh, this uh, person. And uh, so uh, I would like to, uh, you know, uh, go to the contemporary thing that, uh, you know, uh, about the contemporary issue. So as I say, uh, like, you know, we lack leadership, uh, you know, uh, leaders who can you know, lead the public, you know, to the right way. I, I believe, you know, Assam in some way have uh, someone like, you know, Akhil Gogoi, you know, who took people forward, uh, who takes people forward. And, and uh, to me, the importance of Irabod is, you know, it is, he's not just important to the Manipuri, you know, uh, how he worked across the Barak Valley, Surma Valley, and then he even, you know, contested election, uh, you know, in, 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 in Kasar. You know, he lost it, but uh, he was, uh, I, I, I think in, even in Silchar, many people, the non manipuris you know, still celebrate his, uh, you know, life and work. And people talk very highly of him, and uh, it needs to be, uh, you know, uh, for, for me, I am like a, you know, what do you call it, latecomer in the scene. I don't know. I'm just trying, I'm starting to learn things about his and Mira board. And uh, so, um, if you, uh, you know, uh, when I talk about, you know, lacking leaders, uh, you know, uh, uh, we see people, you know, we have like, very promising people uh, among us, but somehow, I don't know, you know, uh, they don't have the, what do you call it, the vision, you know, to, to, to look forward to a certain uh, future. So, like, like uh, I can, you know, and, and what, what the regime right now does is like, you know, not just this regime, I, I think to the Northeastern people, whether it's a, it's, it's a you know, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a lotus or, a, or, or, or a, what do you call this, you know, palm. It's the same thing, you know, for us. Because uh, you look at, you know, though we talk about, you know, militarization in, in, in this, you know, uh, resource extraction and all. So, so th there's a, you know, very consistent way to, you know, how they try to grab the land. Because first you have AFSPA, you know, you, you militarize the land first, you know, and then you, they, they, you know, the, the government here, uh, here are like puppets, you know, they will sign MOU with the, you know, with the, with the, with the, with the, with the masters, and then they will send all these, uh, you know, private limited, you know, uh, you know, mining companies, and then they will take away, you know, your, your resources and all. And now look at CAA, you know, Citizenship Amendment Act. You know, first you, Kill the people, you know, take away the land, you know, resources, and then they want to send, they want to send, you know, outsiders to your land. You know, it's a complete, you know, uh, idea. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a tactics to clean the, you know, wipe out uh, the entire, you know, uh, place, you know, our, our indigenous uh, land. So I think uh, uh, here in this point, you know, that's why I want to, uh, I say, I keep saying that there's no people who can actually. Uh, who, who are leading us in the right way. And then it's high time that, you know, we talk, uh, you know, personality like Izam Irabot, uh, because they, they had a vision, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just talking, I'm not just not just talking about Manipur, but at large, you know, uh, you know how you know, he mobilized the peasants in uh, Barad Valley. You know, he had some, you know, balls to, to do that. And then today's uh, generation, ours, you know, we are so like, you know, what do you call uh, guarded by our four walls and the geographical boundaries, you know, uh, you know, we're just, we become, you know, selfish and, you know, we don't see, you know, how, how we can reach out our hands, uh, you know, to, to my neighbors or, you know, uh, I don't know. Uh, I think Dolly explained it very well, you know, when, when, you know, Assam celebrates Rupa and Hazarika, you know, uh, we should, we should be part of it. And then that's how we respect each other, you know, uh, taking care of each other. I think that's all I wanted to say. Thank you, somebody. You can take over. Uh, thanks a lot, Akko. I think uh, 
the kind of history of uh, Heja Mirabot's own life and struggles and the history of organizing that you spoke about, uh, it really uh, does lead us to the fact that even today there is a need to link the question of resources, the question of identity with the question of how a truly federal structure can operate in the present time. And these are all questions still that need to be resolved through organizing. And that's why figures like Hicham Erebot are still important. And actually, I mean, there's a need for, I mean, perhaps once this, say, the book of poems is translated and other kinds of literature also is available, it would actually be really amazing for everyone to read the kind of work he was doing at that point of time. Uh, because a lot is actually, like you said, there's bits and pieces available, which I was also going through in the process of, like, while speaking to everyone for and today. But there's a lot more that I would also, and we would all like to perhaps uh, read so that answer can be found uh, even from past uh, experiences, while all obviously situated firmly in the present. But uh, yeah, that would be. Huh. A good thing, I guess. I mean, I'm just wondering if this uh, book of, I mean, we can uh, discuss that later. On that note, uh, I also want to call Tarun uh, Bharti to give his comments and speak about Heja Mirabot and other uh, communist leaders of that time period uh, as well, who some answers to the questions we are faced with uh, today in continuity with questions that have remained from the past. So, uh, Tarun, if you can oh, join now. Yeah. The microphone. Uh, um, uh, thank you, Collective, for putting together this uh, panel. It's, uh, it's always fascinating to listen to Dolly, who uh, Anything I read by her is a kind of an education for me in terms of uh, trying to understand the region and Aku, obviously, for the kind of music, uh, path-breaking music in some senses uh, in the region as well as, uh, I always say subcontinent, I don't try to say India because I, you know. Um, uh, uh, it's a... Uh, uh, this event is an important event in the sense that like Irabot or people like Vishnu Rabha or people like Dashrat Deb or people like, the, you know, the history of leftist emancipatory vision is a long one in Northeast. And it is early a footnote to the history of Indian left emancipatory vision. And that's, that's why someone like Irabot, whose life in some ways is a kind of a, draws out a contour of the kind of ways in which progressive movements have started or can be. For instance, uh, if you heard Aku and he gave you a very interesting shot, but you know, where he always, he talked about some of the key moments in his life, um, you know, from a, you know, a social reformer, uh, who joins Communist Party of India and even becomes a candidate for Communist Party of India in Silchar, but decides to move away from Communist Party of India. And that's the, you know, last three years of his life is quite important in the sense that uh, to understand what that emancipatory vision in Northeast looks like. Um, uh, person from Shillong, a very well-known historian, a Khasi historian who wrote in Khasi. He used to have a very interesting formula about whenever he used to talk about Shillong or Khasi Hills, for instance. He said, for people in here, it has been a history of from British India to Bharat India. And unless until we understand these two ends of the colonial experience in the region, we are not going to arrive anywhere. So, for instance, if you look at uh, Irabot, Irabot becomes an MLA, as Shambhavi rightly pointed out, but he becomes an MLA in the assembly which was part of the independent Manipur. And he refuses 
he actually, when India takes over, annexes Manipur by Communist Party of India, which accepts this annexation, Irabot refuses to do that. And he actually, um, he dies on the foothills in the camps of the Burmese Communist Party. And this is something which has happened many times in Northeast, where certain progressive people who come from the region, who in many cases, tribal communist leaders, themselves at variance with the Indian national left movements, who try to appropriate movements in the Northeast in the larger narrative of progressive Indian nationalism. If you look at someone like Bishnu Rabha, for instance, who also gets appropriated by Asmi's elite and you know is declared a nationalist leader. But someone like him, his tribal identity is almost forgotten. Irabot is celebrated by CPI, for instance, uh, as a person who is a peasant leader. But he's never, you know, they always forget to point out that he's also fighting for self-determination of Manipur. But Irabot's life, as I said, is not only about, like Irabot, for instance, is being appropriated by a certain kind of Manipuri nationalist narrative also. If you look at Irabot's life, his arrival at a leftist emancipatory vision starts off by questioning his own internal, you know, his community's own internal oppressions. And if my formula, for instance, for uh, what, what I think uh, is a progressive voice in the region is R2. One is, which is, which acknowledges this you know, shift from one colonization, which is British India, to another form of colonization, which is Bharat India, to acknowledge LG Shulai. And other is people who, people who question their own oppressions. For instance, movements in Khasi Hills, for instance, led by women who question the patriarchies within the region, or in Nagaland, or in Assam, which, you know, like Bishnu Rabha was not only fighting against, um, you know, British colonialism, he was fighting against Jamindars who were actually Asmi's upper caste, caste Hindu Jamindars, you know. So this, con if there is going to be, and I'm, I'm, I, uh, unlike, I, I slightly disagree with Aku, I think that I'm an optimist in that sense, that all around the region, there are people who are questioning their or what you can say, it, uh, they're washing their dirty linen in public because they realize that the liberation which they seek from a colonial rule will not be a liberation if that liberation is not also an internal liberation. Liberation within, within that larger narrative, whether it's Assamese nationalism or a Manipuri nationalism or a Khasi nationalism or any of that kind. Uh, you cannot be substituting uh, one form of nationalism by another form of nationalism. And I think there are movements like that. Someone like Akhil is a good example of that. You know, Akhil is not a defender of Assamese nationalism. He's talking of peasantry. And peasantry is not necessarily for by, uh, by him defined in such narrow sense. So someone like Hijam Mairabod or Vishnu Rabha or Dashrat Deb, or Darlington, Dimpep, there are legions of leaders who have been part of the left movement, or who have tried to imagine left movement or left emancipatory vision in their own terms, uh, in, in their own community terms, in their own geographical terms. Uh, you know, so that is something which we will have to do. And I think that, uh, you know, we need to be celebrating much more of, uh, you know, these figures, uh, you know, well, in the region as well as outside the region. I don't think people outside the region even acknowledge that Northeast has had uh, movements which are, you know, beyond nationalistic movement in that sense. You know, like, uh, if you look at, um, you know, 40s, uh, many movements, even, for instance, Naga nationalist movement has had close relationship with the communists. Uh, People, there are, you know, they, uh, because communists at that time, especially Communist Party of India, 
was not necessarily caught up in defending Indian nation. They defended the right of self-determination. And Irabot said a very nice thing when the Communist Party of India leaders said that, why are you, you know, why are you going underground now? The vision is that I will have a socialist Manipur. And that socialist Manipur will have a relationship with a socialist India. I'm not going to be part of an India which is unfree. Even Bishnu Rabha said, when he, you know, led this major violent uprising in the foothills of uh, Khasi Hills uh, from Beltola onwards. And he said that this freedom, 1940, 15th August, is a fake freedom. Only thing we have changed is the color of the skin. And th those questions are still important and those questions are still being fought about in various different parts of the region. So uh, I thought that um, this is something which I also wanted to ask uh, Dolly after reading her book. Um, and um, and then I will like to uh, you know, come to Aku. To, uh, Dolly, what do you think in terms of how the Indian and colonial extractive industries work? What do you think is its relationship to class um, formations in these societies? the class formation within? Shambhavi, can I respond? Um, that's a, yeah, yeah. Very good, that's sure. a very good question. And I always say that, you know, when, when um, uh, people, um, uh, tribal societies um, come up with this very magnanimous um, phrase, you know, we are, we are an egalitarian society. Um, my appeal to you is that figure out who is saying that. If it's somebody who is coming from uh, getting off from a Toyota Corolla or a Bolero, um, you know, uh, with high walls saying, um, then I think we have to think twice. Uh, about internal class systems, surely, I think that's a very apt question when it comes to resource extraction and also when it comes to what I say larger, the, the conflict economy, right? Because when we think about extraction and the conflict economy in the region, I think uh, there are amazing examples, both from Latin America and from the continent of Africa. And somebody like Mahmoud Mamdani has written a lot in terms of, you know, the class formation. Uh, I, I would still say that, you know, Tarun, your, your question actually, in a way, I think links to this entire very, very colonial and very, very simplistic way of looking at tribal societies in India, right? Um, and and I, I, I talk about, when I talk about inequality, poverty, and structural violence, surely, right, I'm also talking about both from people within who are, who are in a way perpetrating that. It's very important to understand. And the fact that in my book, I talk about coal extraction in Nagaland should make itself clear that Outsiders or non-Nagas have no say, according to Article 371A of the Indian Constitution, within land and what happens to resources within. It's Nagas themselves who get into this kind of, um, I would say, this kind of nexus. Um, the second point that I wanted to say is also that where is that money going and what's happening? And actually that is the tragedy. Uh, Tarun. When we talk about class formation, you have these big guys, you know, who look at five-year election. Uh, I think Meghalaya is the same case yeah. uh, in terms of the, 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 the Kasi Gentia coal extracting families and how we know that some of the most powerful people are actually in a way linked to that. Uh, Arunachal Pradesh as well, since we're talking about coal extraction and extraction um, in, in the Northeast. The story that I tell in my book, Tarun, is this. The big players that get away with it, where increasing number of villages become landless because they have to sell their land so that coal is extracted and coal is explored there. They become landless, and that's in a way related to the second book that I've written, right? leaving the land. That increasingly, there's nothing you can do with the land. It's getting poisoned. It's being deforested. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's in a way being extracted out of everything. So, so, so the, as, as tribal people become become poor, where do they go? It's the second 
story that I tell in my second book. But in terms of internal transformation, all that, the, the division between the rich and the poor is so stark that even in terms of the anger and in terms of the impunity that I talk about that the rich can get away with is a reality. And I think we have to talk about this. You see a very important thing, Tarun, because I was also realizing that. And when we talk about the tribal rich, let's not forget how they are also connected to the valley. We have two very special valleys in the northeastern region of India. Uh, you know, the, the, the Imphal Valley and the Brahmaputra Valley. When it comes to the tribal elites, do a mapping. The, the Kasi elite, the Naga elite, uh, the, 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 the Arunachili elite will be very tied up at the level of family, at the level of networks. So if you do not belong to that circle, and they are very clued into that, then the, the, the Imphal Valley and also the Brahmaputra elite circles, right? So if you are not tied into that, you don't exist within that world. Talk about elite, perhaps the Naga elite themselves. Look at where they look at look 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 at the marriages and look at the world, right? That they are part of. That it's so easy. That it's so smooth. So in a way, by that, what I am also signifying is that when we talk about the elite worlds, they're actually in a sense learning from one another. They're in a sense, I think, growing in network. That's something as an anthropologist has been fascinating because you scratch the elite world. You just remove the facade, right, of this elite world that, you know, they can make it on their own. It's all a lie, Tarun. And here it goes. Here it goes for people who are listening and all. You know, do a mapping. Because when it comes to resource extraction, especially in the Brahmaputra Valley, we have to look at the tea societies, right? We have to look at the plantation families. And I've often wondered that people and children from the oil and tea world and the way that they've propagated the idea of class and the idea of aesthetics and the idea of what, what constitutes culture has been in a way fascinating. Uh, they grow up in the tea plantations, but of course, right, it's high culture. They don't talk about like, quote unquote, the coolie food. They have no idea what the plantation laborers are eating. They talk about about Naga food, Naga cuisine, surely. And that was why I also made sure that I made a 10-minute short documentary on bamboo shoot and where it's coming from, right? Because at the at the core of it, Tarun, when you talk about elite, elite culture, what is at the center of it? Because if you talk about production in Nagaland and if you talk about what we are eating, it's really so dangerous that right now we have propagated the idea of Naga cuisine where we don't even produce enough. <laughs> like, sure. We are really from Jorhat, and then we are saying, you know, it's part of Naga cuisine. So I think it's in a sense related to very much the Mirapod and, you know, what do we produce? And I would love, in fact, I would love it if, of course, someone can help us yeah. figure out the speech that he made in 1939 during the second Lupilan. What did he say that speech? It would be fascinating because today, my last point is that it is related to the food sovereignty movement that we are talking about. It is eventually related to that. And thank God, that during the pandemic, everyone is aware that, you know, whether we have enough to eat or not enough to eat. So everything is being heightened. So I think that's important. So that's my roundabout way of your question. Thank you, Tarun, as always, for your provocative questions. So, Aku, uh, picking up from uh, Dolly's thing about the, you know, rise of this new elite, you know, which has close relationship with you know, big families, you know, Marwadi capital, all that kind of a thing. Do you think that uh, sometimes um, uh, movements in the region um, try to hide this class contradiction within? Uh, uh, I think so. But, but what I feel is, uh, you know, the, the elite class often tries to, you know, uh, try to act like, you know, uh, they want to be there, you know, in, in, the, in this uh, movement, in this movement. But, but in fact, actually, they are the ones that we need to fight yeah. first. You know, I mean, I mean, that's how I feel. I don't know what I mean. I can't hear you. No, in which sense, you know, fight them first? How? Do you... No, because because they they need to be exposed. They they need to be you know they need to be taught. Because 
in Imphal, you know, of course, uh, I am friends with, you know, all kinds of people. You know, I'm a musician, you know, I interact with, you know, the rich class, the elite class, you know, I get to work with the, you know, with, with, with the people, you know, who I organize, you know, things with. So, uh, I came across many people, you know, uh, you know, who actually, you know, try to get, you know, things from both sides. So it's very, uh, you know, you have to be very uh, clear about things that you want. I mean, especially for someone who, uh, you know, who, who, who has been part of a movement or something like that. Because in Manipur, you know, the elites will be part yeah. of the movement also, you know. And then again, and then again, you know, they will get the perks of being the, you know, spoiled brat or, uh, or you know. <laughs> So this is, uh, so, so you need to have a very, uh, what do you call it? I, I mean, for me, I'm very careful about who I do events with and who I, where I perform and then what kind of, you know, money I get, uh, you know. I mean, for example, like I organize a festival, you know, uh, from whom I take money and all. This is like, you know, for me, uh, I'm very careful, you know. I don't want to be the collaborator with these people. I mean, you know. Questions? The audience, Tambavi. Uh, I mean, uh, if other people who have also joined, if they have comments or questions, who have joined here on uh, uh, this thing. Uh, otherwise, I think one of the most uh, like important or whatever uh, memorable things you also said was that. Uh, even though, uh, like, as you pointed out, that Heja uh, Mirabot is talking about an independent uh, Manipur, but he's also at the same time saying that it has to be a socialist Manipur, which has relations with the socialist uh, in India. But I think uh, does get lost in the kinds of... Uh, does get lost when the, that kind of emancipatory vision, I guess, is uh, missing. That what kind of uh, society or state we actually want to build becomes a secondary uh, concern. But to have a socialist Manipur in relation with socialist India is actually a brilliant way of uh, uh, vision across. And it would actually be lovely if one could uh, read or uh, like. Have, I mean, only read like because there is no recording or uh, translations of his speeches and other work. That in itself is something that's quite, I mean, uh, possible. Some and it's like, uh, as you said, like uh, I mean, while we are holding this, uh, also want to extend our solidarity to uh, all political prisoners and Akhil Gokoi as well who have precisely been in prison because they are ra raising all these questions uh, and they're linking together different struggles uh, and building a kind of mass movement along these lines, which kind of uh, encapsulates that uh, emancipatory vision which you also uh, spoke about. Look at one. A uh, question that we uh, don't these elites seem to be similar to the to the dynasts uh, who ruled Europe at one time is one question that we uh, got to the dynasties who ruled Europe at one time. That's the question. If anyone wants to uh, respond to that. Like, what exactly are these uh, networks of elites that uh, were being spoken about, I guess? Uh, Dolly, let's press that. that. Hmm. Should go to Dolly for ethnic uh, for ethnic. We wanted to just contextualize uh, that to notice, which becomes a very important conversation. Um, one of perhaps 
to the realities that we can keep in mind as we're looking at the Northeast. Like I say, it's also the history of militarization, right? The history of militarization, uh, the violence, and, and in a sense, how do we make sense of power and power networks that come up during this time? Uh, what I would do is actually give you that question. So if you're thinking about power networks in a region like the Northeast or even Kashmir, um, think about it. What constitutes such kind of networks to operate and those elites to operate? Uh, they are very, how can I say, um, yeah, so I think these are important questions. I can I can go on about this, but 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 perhaps it's it's not to it's not to I think uh, you know I, I I am a I how can I say I you know I am an anthropologist and I'm first generation and I feel that very much at, at a personal level. My my parents, both parents, didn't go to university, um, and and so I'm I'm the first one in the family to do to do a, then a PhD, you know, to be a teacher. And so when I look around the Northeast, I feel it very, very much, even in a personal way, because I, I work in Australia, as you all know, I go back to India for my research, and I see how easy it is for people from, from really that, that class circle to just give me a call and say, you know, my, my, my son or my daughter wants to go to the US, to the UK, how, how should they do it? And, and, and I, for, for me, as a teacher, I'm very, very uh, clear. If a student wants to talk to me, they talk to me directly, right? Uh, but then I also realized that certain things operate in that way, in that world, that I'm not part of. Uh, what I find offensive, perhaps, because my parents never did that. I, my parents never did that. They, and, and in a way, I think I operate within a very different constellation. Uh, my, like Aku said, who I, who I hang out with is very important for me, right? Because I am not interested in the single star or the stardom, right? You are a star, you shine bright, you die, you're dust, nothing. But when you're part of a constellation of really a political vision and where you're going in a journey, the constellations have a story to tell and the charge, both perhaps, they tell us about the past. We are talking about Hijam Mirapod in a sense of the universe that he traversed, that the universe and the, and the, and the networks that he could reach onto. So perhaps the idea of elite and elitism needs to be looked at within that as well. If we pigeonhole all these conversations to say that that family or this family, and I think what we end up doing is we end up bad mounting it. That means our political vision is quite narrow, right? We are going to go above that and see that what is it that these networks do to survive and how do they survive? And what is it that in our political who is talking about, the one is stubborn is talking about, the one perhaps the collective is listening to. What is it that in this constellation of conversation we are trying to do? And how is it that it is reflected in our lives, in what we do together? And I think that is the key that we need to think about. That is the key. And for me, I deeply, deeply feel it. Like I said, as a first generation university student, um, I, I, I see how, how things operate back home. Uh, and so, yeah, and so I think that the struggle continues, um, you know. So thank you for the question. I'll stop you. Um, thank you. Uh, there was another thing that I personally also wanted to know, because uh, I was reading a bit about Hedda life uh, as well uh, before we organized this. But as everyone's pointed out, the literature available, especially like in English, is quite little. But uh, so the exact kind of organizing he did uh, is not really coming across in the stuff I read. So, I mean, there's a broad historical trajectory one can see, like there's the Nupilan moment and he takes some inspiration from that, his journey after that and the various moments at which he is persecuted, imprisoned, exiled. Just moments, but the like real, uh, like the stuff of organizing, what exactly he was doing, was organizing around. If anyone could just uh, speak a little on that, for everyone who's joined, 
as well because this was something we were all like but, uh, it would be interesting to read but huh, sadly it's not available so easily so because there's a period of his life where he is actually not in manipur as well he is in an outside manipur so what is he doing in that time period and uh, yeah because ha huh, there's only a broad historical just that uh so if anyone wants to just go over that briefly Uh, Aku actually has been working on a fascinating journey of Manipuri diaspora, and actually, if outside Manipur is obviously not restricted to that diaspora, but that diaspora is very interesting in the sense of groups of people he starts organizing. So there are Manipuri peasants or tenants actually who work on jamin, you know, or uh, they rent out land from Bengali jamindars in. Um, Uh, Silhet and Maimon Singh in Kachhar, so he organizes them. So they're you know uh, as part of Krishak Sabha kind of a thing. But he also organizes tea garden labor. And one of the things uh, actually when we are looking at extractive industries uh, and you know and the emancipatory visions in Northeast, some of the first rebellions or insurrections have happened in. plantation economy for instance or oil dig famous dig boy oil strike everyone talks about that first big bombay textile mills strike but it actually dig boy oil mill strike strike predates that so he he's part of organizing he he actually goes to even he is uh, uh, you know he helps trade unionists in dig boy because there are manipuri workers there he uh, tries to organize unions of tea garden labor and that's a very famous a uh, movement by them where they actually uh, two or three tea gardens in uh, in kachhar workers leave the tea garden and go away that's the actually these tea gardens are shut down for two years and irabot is a big leader of that but along with his he's in in some sense he's not a leader who just merely organizes he also has you know he's a cultural figure he dances he plays music you know uh, hemango bishwas's fascination with um uh, someone like irabot is this he's a classic combination which uh, you know a hindu bengali or hindu bihari or a hindu indian or a, you know cannot understand where there are divisions of labor here is a guy who can go and give a speech he can sit in a meeting and he can get up and dance irabot is known to dance he organizes a dance troupe and you know the famous netrakona conference uh, of kisan sabha his troop where he's dancing himself and playing the drums so irabot's life outside manipur is equally fascinating and it's so sad that there's no work on him you know in that sense there's no interesting biography and i think it's important that we write a kind of not a hagiography but a political biography of irabot we have to write a political biography of vishnu rabha we have to write a political biography of dashrat deb there are people you know who are not written about but irabot's work uh in the kind of person he is is a fascinating thing he's a political person he's a cultural person he's you know he knows about he's a, a vernacular ethnographer he writes about maithai culture he writes about he writes textbooks so it's like a you know he's, he's all in one kind of a figure you know and we can't escape him that's why uh thanks a lot uh, tarun one last kind of comment that came on the page was not a question per se was about the fact that uh, gradually uh, across the political spectrum people are actually rediscovering figures like uh, irabot uh, but uh, probably in isolation from his entire ideology i mean even the state celebrates irabote from that to like all across the spectrum uh, historical figures are being but uh, so it's i guess just a question in some sense uh, it's just a comment in some sense and not uh, an entire question per se but yeah what would you have to say about that how does one remember figures without 
their entire ideology uh, being remembered as well. I guess. Huh? Um, <laughs> that's a that's a very good question, and it and that's why the collective and what you are doing, right? if we have to contextualize it, right this moment we are talking about okay, holding the state accountable is in a way holding the process of sanitizing history accountable. So if we have to say that certain figures are given certain colors, saffron colors, white colors, red colors, and certain figures are so sanitized in a way that they are extracted, once again, the word extracted, and they are placed as heroes, what does it say about the state project? Right? Uh, and so like I said, when I came on board this evening, I was very, very nostalgic because this is something that a lot of my very... Uh, uh, friends from Manipur celebrated of the names that I named, two of them have passed on uh, bless their souls um, and so in a way I think this is a project then, right? this is a project even for the collective, how do you take on, uh, if you know that Aku um, our dearest Aku here is not a uh, he, he's a trained scientist he's a trained physicist, don't forget he has a, he has a PhD in physics and a postdoc in physics the fact that he's doing a music project, the fact that he's tracing the poetry of Tarapur, Aku is one of our heroes who will go down in history pretty much, you know, as a person of science, as a person of music, a composer, uh, you know, a, 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 a collaborator with, with activists, a visionary, and perhaps what Tarapur's life beyond, after a point, when it comes to ideas and visions of justice and visions of emancipation, no discipline, no boundaries can hold you. And we see that from every revolutionary, Victor Hara, whether it's, you know, this, this, this modern day Che Guevara, or, or I would name women as well, right? Whether it's Alexander Kolonatai, Rosa Luxemburg, Clara, Clara Zetkins, you look at their lives, the fact that a particular, after a particular kind of engaging with these issues, you break boundaries. And it's the boundary of the mind right? to say that, all right, I'm just going to talk about this idea because it doesn't fall within the principles. I'm not going to talk about that idea. And perhaps what Parapot's life shows us is really the bridging of a point when it comes to ideas, ideas of justice or vision. And your question then, Sambhavi, perhaps I'll give it back to you, to the collective, because we are your guests, is that how do you, as part of the collective, carry on with that? How do you, I don't know your discipline, but maybe perhaps a, a scholar of literature, um, you know, or perhaps a, a biologist, how do you then cross over and look at theater, right, as something that can also change lives and be part of? perhaps this, this process of justice that we are seeking. And I think to celebrate our point is for us to actually get out of our comfort zone. It's for me to get out of my comfort zone to say that, oh my Lord, how does he do theater? And how does he, how does he publish a handwritten, a handwritten um, a magazine? Uh, and it's to understand eventually this restlessness sense of the human spirit as they strive towards understanding a just future. He died young, he died 51, he died of typhoid, he died in the foothills, like Tarun said, at the, at the camp of the Burmese Communist um, uh, Party. Uh, how do we begin to understand? I think Aku has with his music by going around Kachar Silet, and I think we are going to follow him and in the compositions that he does, in the stories that he has collected, right, that also becomes perhaps our chanting and our, our journey along with that. So, so I think this is a very, very important conversation that we are having. Oh, okay. Thanks a lot. And perhaps we'll have Aku again soon, uh, one day with... Uh, Probably a cultural performance as well. He's been doing. Actually, I suggested it earlier, but he made a suggestion. But uh, yeah, I mean, we could have a, a cultural event which places the politics and the history of the struggle as well in a different kind of form uh, as well. Because 
important to uh, remember all aspects of the organizer and activist that Irabut was. Uh, on that note, I guess uh, I also want to thank everyone who's uh, joined today. Uh, thank you for all your comments, uh, the insights that you've provided. From Collective, we've uh, tried to do this uh, event to perhaps, as uh, that comment was also posted, uh, recover from history of figure which has not perhaps been uh, celebrated or remembered in the entirety of his uh, work. On the 28th, also, we'll be having a program, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, it's Bhagat Singh's birth anniversary and Shankar Bhuvan Yogi's, both of whom were also historical uh, uh, and uh, revolutionaries. So, uh, on that note, I just want to thank everyone and uh, thanks for joining. And in solidarity with everyone who's uh, been in prison for similarly raising uh, questions that Irabot was also raising for uh, having their own emancipatory visions. Uh, we want to thank everyone and conclude uh, this event today on behalf of Collective. I just want to thank all the speakers again. Uh, yeah, that's all. Thank you so much. And we should do a Irabot thank salute. You. Red salute. Oh, yes. yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Thank you.